Hey y'all, so I got a few things to say before this video starts. If you guys don't already follow me on Twitter, you need to. The link will be in the description below. Also, this video is sponsored by Horror Amino. Horror Amino is this amazing new app where you can talk about your favorite horror movies and forums with other people. I've had a few go-arounds on there myself, but I always end up winning. In this app, you can chat with other fans and make new friends, vote on your favorite actors, characters, stories, movies, and etc. You can find and discuss movies, TV shows, stories, and books recommended by a community that knows horror better than anywhere else. You can read and publish original horror stories and creepypastas. I suggest you guys get on there as soon as possible and follow me. We can have a banter back and forth about who is the scariest movie villain of all time. My name on there is Scary Stuff Ding, so I hope to see all of you on there. And I hope you enjoy this video of the top 10 stories ever told on my channel. Well, in my opinion at least. I'm a 21 year old male, going through some rough times, but nothing comes close to encountering a monster hell bent on getting me. This is my story. It all started on June 2013, a few months after I turned 18. I was very depressed and lacked any type of social skills, always saying that no one would be my friend by me going up to strangers and asking them personally. The only human contact that I had were my parents, my 17 year old brother who I didn't get along with, and my 15 year old cousin who visits quite frequently. On one of his visits, he informed me about a new app he had discovered called Melt. For those who don't know, Melt is an app in which people create a profile with their phone number without anyone ever learning of your number. You could then create a username and post your likes, movies, books, TV shows, etc with only a picture of that like and a sentence description. At the time, Mel was only available for iPhones. Anyways, people could then post a picture with a title and a description. After posting, the user could see random posts from other users and the users were given the option to either comment, like, or swipe to view another picture. Users could also like other profiles and add friends. After a week of getting the app and messing around, I befriended almost all the trolls and jokesters who I could get along with in real life, while I pissed off the rest by trolling or insulting them for my amusement, mainly people who thought they were better than everyone else. Two months passed and I had eased up on the trolling, as I tried my best to make friends so that I could actually go out and have fun. Now that I've explained the backstory, I can tell you the story of how I met my stalker. I had just arrived home from work as an assistant and translator for my uncle's construction work. It was somewhere around 11.30 at night, so I was ready for bed. As I changed out of my work uniform, I noticed that I had a notification from Mel. It was a friend request, so I decided to check out who this was. To be honest, I really don't remember the name since it was numbers and symbols. So we'll just call him Jim. His profile was almost empty, except for his birthday and profile pic, which showed an older man in his early to mid 50s. He looked chubby and wore glasses. Didn't look like a creep, but maybe like the quiet neighbor that you'd wave to from time to time. Anyways, normally I wouldn't add older people, but I noticed that he had the same exact birthday as me. I found this to be interesting. I had never met someone the same exact birthday as me, so I added him and sent him a message saying something like, Hey there, I never met someone with the same birthday as me. Afterwards, I put my phone down and began changing my clothes, when not five seconds later, my phone dings. It was Jim, so I checked as I finished putting on my pajamas. He said, Whoa, I didn't notice. Maybe I can suck your dick sometime as a late birthday present. This didn't really creep me out, but kind of stunned me. Not because he was gay, but because he was so direct. 
I responded with, I'm flattered, but I'm actually straight. Again, he replied a few seconds later, You don't have to be gay to get your dick sucked. A blowjob is a blowjob. Plus, a man knows how to please another man. That disturbed me a bit, but I continued to be polite and declined. For a while, he continued with these types of messages until I reached my limit and stopped being nice. I said, Look, I have already told you to stop. I'm not gay, and if you continue to disrespect my sexual orientation, then I can just block you. I was ready to block this jerk, but before I could, he responded with, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. I thanked him and I went to bed, putting that behind me. A week passed by, and I hadn't heard from Jim since that first encounter. I was going through a phase, and I had decided to cut my hair into a mohawk, and dyed it red. I took pictures of myself, and posted them in almost all my social media pages to show off how punk I was. Big mistake. So I was watching The Big Bang Theory with my brother, when my phone dinged. It was Jim. Hello, he said. I must have seemed annoyed because my brother quickly asked what was wrong, in which I responded with a simple nothing. Hi, I responded, and returned to my program. My phone rang once again, and he said, I like your red mohawk. I thanked him, only to receive another message before I could lock my phone that said, It's sexy. I just rolled my eyes and decided to ignore the bastard, thinking that he'd stop. Big mistake. My phone rang almost every 30 seconds, which annoyed me, so I silenced it. Afterwards, I went to take a shower and got dressed for bed, only to return to the living room and grab my phone. As I checked the messages, I could swear that my heart stopped for a brief second. He had sent almost a total of 50 messages and counting, as he was still sending messages. A chill ran up my spine as I read through them. The first few were of Jim complimenting my hair but then apologizing for being flirty. Then, Jim began blaming me because I was the one who threw signs at him by dyeing my hair. The final messages were of Jim threatening me and promising to find me no matter what it takes. Even though I was now terrified, enough was enough. My fear turned into anger as I told him that he had stepped over the line and he can just go fuck himself. I didn't even wait for his reply. I quickly removed him as a friend and blocked him. How I wish I could say that this was the end, but I soon came to learn that this was only the beginning. It was now November, and 2014 was just around the corner. My visits to Melt were so much more constant than any of my other social media apps, as I had made a number of friends ranging from my home in Texas all the way to California, Tennessee, and Georgia. I would usually Skype or FaceTime them at night, and we would talk for hours and show off my new Dutch Shepherd, Nina. One morning, I had just arrived at the dog park with Nina, when I received a friend request on Skype. It was a username that only had numbers, but no profile picture. Without even thinking, I added them, and continued to play catch with Nina. A few minutes passed, when I received a Skype call from this user. I was about to decline, but saw that Nina's best friend, Chloe, and her owners were just coming in so I decided to answer. Hello? I said. I heard breathing, and what sounded like whimpering, followed by someone saying, I'm so sorry. It sounded like a man trying to make a feminine voice, but his years of smoking didn't help. Uh, who's this? I asked, ignoring the whimpering, only for it to go silent on the other end for what seemed like a minute. I asked again, who is this? I was ready to hang up when I heard him speak clearly. Your hair is longer and still sexy. The color of my face drained as I hung up and blocked this user. I got really paranoid and was turning every 10 seconds to see if someone was watching me. He clearly saw my updated picture on my Skype, but I was still very frightened. How the fuck did he get my Skype? And why, after months of silence, he finally decided to contact me again. After a few days of more silence, he began harassing me on kick, first asking me to forgive him, only to get angry and call me a faggot when I wouldn't answer. 
I went block his account, only for him to create a new one and start the process again. He would apologize, threaten me, then apologize, and threaten me again. When he realized that this wouldn't work, he would pretend to be a female and would ask for nudes. I normally get lots of spamming perverts on kick, which I would just ignore. But when they begin to threaten you with the same threats that Jim would usually say, I knew how to distinguish the spam and the fake Jim accounts. At first, I found this amusing because I could imagine chubby little Jim crying as he tried to create a new account, only to have it blocked. Well, my amusement disappeared when he found me on Facebook, then Twitter, and then even Instagram, making posts and comments that targeted me. He would say how he had sex with me, and how I'm actually gay and needed to be raped. This pushed me to make my account more private, and I also had to change my name and social medias. How the fuck was he finding my accounts? I began asking my friends I melt, but no one seemed to have even heard of Jim. I did begin to think about calling the police, but then a thought ran up into my brain. I had deleted everything. This pissed me off even more, because I never even thought about taking screenshots or saving them. Then, I also began to think about how the police would blame me for leading this pervert on, or that they would probably laugh at the situation. That's why I decided to keep this from everyone, including my family. The best I could do at that point was hope that Jim would get bored and it would all die off. For the rest of November, he stopped bothering me, mainly because I had changed almost everything in my profiles and had made everything very private. And that's when the texting began and the calls. I would block his number, but he would quickly get a new one. He's probably using a texting app and he would continue. For Christmas, my parents decided to get me a new phone for helping them with bills and rent which I accepted, while my stepdad got my old phone, with him keeping the same number. I never even thought about Jim while we did all this, as he had again stopped. Again, I forgot all about Jim, and it was now 2014. I was in my room, playing PlayStation, when my stepdad burst into my room. He was pissed. I asked what was wrong, and what he told me just infuriated me to my breaking point. He told me how an old man had FaceTimed him, asked for me, and then hung up when my stepdad asked who he was. My stepdad then began asking if I was gay, and if I was making money by sleeping with other dudes. We got into an argument, which caused me to take the phone, go into the backyard and FaceTime Jim. Enough was enough. I was so tired of this bullshit. I didn't want this to continue into another year. It took a few tries until he finally answered. His face was full of shock as I stared into the lens. Not the screen, but the lens. I had nothing to look at. I only had words to say. If you ever call this number again, or try in any way to contact me, I swear to whatever the fuck you believe in that I will track you down and slice your dick off before feeding it to your ass, you fat, disgusting, Sorry excuse for a human being. Horror struck his face as I said these words, only to turn into anger. In his feminine voice, he said that I needed to shut my mouth before he called the cops. You're gonna call the cops? I yelled. I couldn't believe this fucking moron had actually said that. I was baffled and began calling him pathetic as he shushed me. I threatened to call the cops myself and asked him to call them, almost giving my address. I quickly stopped myself before giving him the bird, hanging up and blocking him. I was vibrating in rage as I handed my stepdad his phone and went into my room and punched the wall before laying down. The rest of 2014 went by smoothly and I ended up moving out of my parents' house and with a friend. Jim was all in the past and I would joke to my roommates about how I was almost raped by an old pervert. 2015 came and still nothing. I had not had a thought about Jim for over a year, and was more focused on life than anything else. My roommate and I were struggling with money, and had moved into a Motel 6 after being evicted from our trailer. It was late August, sometime after 9am, when my roommate was at work. I had not slept all night due to insomnia that I still suffer from. I was laying down, watching funny YouTube videos, and I received an email. I opened it with the subject reading, hello, and a brief message saying, hey there, 
I got the weed. I was confused at first, but then I remembered how my roommate's phone had been disconnected, and that maybe he gave his drug dealer my email so that he wouldn't have my number. My roommate was a pothead. I quickly replied by telling him that my roommate was probably the one he was looking for, but that he was at work. I quickly sent it and began brushing my teeth when I received another reply. As I read it, everything came flooding back. All that fear, anger, and alone. How come you haven't left your room all day? I felt paralyzed. I couldn't even blink. I always heard how people would stay put when in danger instead of running, but I didn't think that it would ever happen to me. I responded with, how do you know I'm in a room? Thinking that maybe he was just being a dick until he said, because I'm outside the Motel 6. At that instant, I ran to the front door and locked it and looked out the window. At first I only saw cars, lines parked in front of the room, not paying attention to movement because I was replaying the scream, opening scene in my head, over and over again. As I shook it out of my mind, trying to convince myself that it was probably my roommate fucking with me, I saw him. It was Jim. He was standing about 100 feet from my door, facing my door, but looking down at his phone as he leaned back to a wood fence that split the Motel 6 from a mechanic shop. He wore stupid glasses, was a bit chubby, not as chubby as I thought he was. His beard had come in, and he was actually somewhere around 6 foot 4 or 6 foot 5. I could tell because I myself am 6 foot 2 and was the size of a hole that was in that fence while he passed it. I then wrote, as calm as I could, though very scared, I need you to stop replying. I saw his face light up as he replied. He sent me an email asking him to leave my socks outside my door as he walked to where my neighbor to the right is, out of view from the window. This terrified me even more, as I thought that he would jump out at me if I were to open that door. As I tried really hard not to shit myself, I quickly ran to the restroom and locked myself in. As I called one of my roommate's co-workers, though I never got an answer. When I didn't reply, he responded 10 minutes later with, Alright, see you around. Followed by a winking face. I waited another 5 minutes before stepping out, only to feel a chill down my spine, as I realized that the red car parked in front of my room was gone. I ended up telling my roommate about it, who became wary, and decided to teach me how to defend myself, and how to read others. He was in the Marines for two years. After that one incident, we moved to another room, and would see that same red car circling the motel. At one point, my roommate, while drunk, chased after it, only for whoever the driver was to take off. I wasn't even sure if that was his car, until the car took off when they saw my roommate approaching them. Two months later, my roommate and I began having some issues and decided to leave. He went to a shelter while I moved back to my parents and eventually to Midland. I continued my own training by attending small clubs and wrestling my friends. The last message that I received from Jim was in October of 2015. It read, Where the hell did you go? I deleted that message and have since got a new phone. It has now been more than six months without hearing from that bastard, but I wouldn't be surprised if he pops out one day. He tends to do that. But now, I'm ready. I'm not the stupid and fearful teen I once was. Whether I go to the police or have a one-on-one -on -one combat with Jim, he will disappear from my life. Whether he ends up in a cell or a body bag matters not. Though I'd prefer the latter, for all the fear and torment that he made me go through for three years. With that being said, Jim, for your sake, let's never fucking meet again, you pathetic sack of donkey tits. I was about 24 at the time, and living in Portland, Oregon. Portland is a place to see some pretty weird people, and not get taken notice of if you happen to be one yourself. My neighborhood was just outside of downtown, on a pretty quiet highway, 
and the world food store I worked at was just a mile down the street. It was a cheap place to live, and if I had to guess why, it would probably be at least partially due to the methadone patients that were frequently dropped off at the various hotels in the neighborhood. One night at around 10 p.m., after closing up with my manager at the store, I walked to my car around back of the building to see a rather frazzled, dirty-looking couple standing in the shadows near my vehicle. I had lived in the area long enough to know that random muggings didn't really happen. The worst that would happen is that they would ask me for change that I would usually agree to empty my pockets of. And they took notice of me as I jingled my keys and started to walk over. It was then that I noticed that neither the guy or the girl was wearing shoes or socks. I began to reach into my pocket before they even got to me, but to my surprise, the guy pulled out a $10 bill and asked if I would please drive he and his girlfriend out of the area. I had heard stories as a kid of hitchhikers killing people on dark highways, but these kids looked to be late teenagers and pretty harmless. I figured they were dropped off here like the other outpatients, and decided to hear their story. As his girlfriend stood sheepishly a distance away, he spun me a story involving a magazine-selling cult that would take in kids off the street, but then make them sell magazines door to door, then pick them up and take them back to the compound. They were watched at all times. He said at the big house they all stayed in, it was locked down at night and added, they took our shoes, locked them up so we wouldn't run. I doubted the story's validity, but I had made up my mind to give them a ride. Just then, a big white van with blacked out windows came screeching to a halt directly in front of my car. The driver was a large Caucasian man in his late 30s to early 40s with a shaved head and a sturdy build. I didn't get a good look at his passenger. The kids ran for it, and after a hateful stare from the driver to me, he backed out and tried to head them off from the other side. I got them inside the grocery store before he made it into the parking lot. My manager, a tall intimidating Syrian man, called the police as the van circled the building a few times. It eventually disappeared, probably after the men realized we would have called the police. The guy called his mom and I drove them to a safe place to be picked up, making sure I was not followed. They hugged me and tried to give me money, but I would have felt shitty taking it. I drove away before the guy's mom showed up. To this day, I wish I had stayed with them until I knew they were safe. I hope they're okay. As a teenager, I was always a skeptic of all those psychic shows where the host would sit down with a random stranger and somehow tell them about their lost loved ones and how they tried to communicate with them from the afterlife. I was a skeptic until I met a distant relative of mine. This man, who I only knew as Bach Thin, I'm Vietnamese, was visiting from the U.S and was my grandfather's cousin. He claimed to be able to see ghosts. I'm not gonna lie, I thought he was a total schizophrenic nut job at first, but I was curious to hear some of his stories. So he told me about a time one of his close friends had said she was starting to feel sick inside of her own home. No matter what kind of remedies she tried or doctors she went to, she'd always end up sick for long periods of time. So one day, Bok Thin decided to visit her at home. Immediately, he noticed a strong odor, a smell of rotting flesh, which only he could smell. He walked through the house and noticed an old piano nestled in the corner of her room. Where did you buy that? He asked, to which she replied that she bought it from a garage sale. Bok Thin continued on into the house and walked into her kitchen. He told me that right as he entered her kitchen, on the top of her fridge, sat a man. His face a sickly green tinge. He reeked of rotting flesh. The man sat there 
smiling creepily down at them, not saying a word. Just sat there like he was waiting for something or someone. Bakhtin immediately knew that this man was somehow connected to the piano his friend had just bought. He thought maybe it was the dead owner that refused to leave his prized piano behind. Staying silent, he quietly turned around and told his friend to immediately sell the piano and leave the house. According to Bak Thin, after leaving the house and the piano behind, the bouts of sickness never returned to her. Jokingly, I asked him why he didn't try asking the ghost to leave. The atmosphere tensed and Bak Thin looked me right in the eye and said, Don't ever talk to the dead. He told me that the dead lived in their own dimension, their own world. Because of that, the dead would always try to communicate with the living. They wanted a connection like a real human would with other people. He said that as soon as they knew you could see them and communicate with them, they'd latch onto you and never stop following you. After all of that, I still sort of doubted all of his stories and warnings. I mean, they were all stories, right? But curiously enough, at that moment, my grandma came down to sit and chat. After a while, my grandma left the room to grab tea, and Bach then turned to my family to give us a strange warning. Now, my grandma had always wanted to visit Vietnam again, ever since moving here to Canada. At the time, she was 83 years old. Bach then said that if we were to take her to Vietnam, she'd have to go before her 94th birthday, not a year later. After that, she would not be able to go. With that, Bach then said goodbye and left for his hotel. I never saw him again. Fast forward 11 years, a few weeks before my grandmother's 94th birthday. I sensed something off about her. Her cheeks were no longer pink, but instead yellow. In fact, her whole face looked like a deep yellow. A couple days later, after a doctor visit, my grandma was diagnosed with old age leukemia. Her bone marrow just decided to stop producing blood. Two weeks later, one day after her 91st birthday, my grandma passed away. Creepiest part? I received a phone call that same day from Bach Thin at his home in the U.S., offering his condolences for our loss. Not a single person in my family had told anyone about her death. He, he already knew. To this day, I often find myself thinking about the things he's told me. I'd be lying if I told you I didn't now believe some of it. I sometimes imagine the dead just staring at me while I'm alone in my home, waiting patiently for you to give them a sign that you can see them. My question to you is, if you could speak to Bach Thin about your future, or that of your loved ones, would you? I know I wouldn't. This incident occurred on the afternoon of March 19th. My 14-year-old daughter, Trisha, was out with her friend from the neighborhood, Tiffany, who was 16. The girls, along with several other friends, are always hiking and hanging out in the woods near our home. They've all been gathering scraps of wood and my contribution of a hammer and nails to build a clubhouse. On this particular afternoon, however, the other kids weren't home. So it was only Trisha and Tiffany exploring the woods. That day, they decided to explore another part of the woods where they had never ventured. The girls would later tell me that they hadn't talked about where exactly they would go. They both just began walking, neither saying a word to each other. They each claimed that they actually felt like they were being guided on where to go. There wasn't a trail or any sort of path they were following but they both would make right and left turns together in a near zigzag sort of way. They had been gone for about a couple of hours when I suddenly felt the urge to check on them. Trisha is pretty bad about answering her phone. I had been scolding her for that lately, but it was something I was used to. Normally, 
I would get angry if she doesn't answer the phone or my text messages. This day, however, I was getting really nervous for some reason. I just had a bad feeling. Since I'm naturally a mistrusting person, and I listen to all sorts of stories about child molesters and kidnappers seeking girls for sex trafficking rings. I'm always preaching to Trisha and her friends about safety. I felt a knot in my stomach as I continued to text and call, getting no answer. I was about to call Tiffany's phone when suddenly my phone rang. It was Trisha, but as soon as I answered, the phone went dead. Of course, I tried calling back. But there was no answer. Now I was really worried. I had a migraine that day. So I called my neighbor and asked if she had seen the girls. She knew I was really worried. So she offered to go looking for them. She knew where they liked to hike in the woods. And she offered to go. Neither of us had any idea they had gone to another part of the woods. I told my other neighbor. And he immediately put his shoes on. And was out the door. Going to look for the girls. What was going on? Within 10 minutes, I had several people out looking for the girls. I should add here that this is the first time I have ever done this. I'm not one of these hysterical, overprotective mothers who panics about everything. My daughter has taken self-defense classes and she carries a pocket knife along with a police issue taser I gave her for Christmas last year. I also make her stay with large groups of other kids usually. It was just this one time she was out with only one friend. This was the first time I've had a dark feeling that something was terribly wrong. I continued calling the girls, to no avail. I even called Tiffany's dad, who is a complete weirdo whom I avoid like the plague, to see if they had stopped by his house. He hadn't seen them, but hearing the alarm in my voice, he too went out looking. I got down on my knees and prayed to God to protect the girls and bring them home. I prayed Psalm 91, which is known as a prayer of protection. To my great relief, just a few minutes later, the girls burst through the door, out of breath and looking pale as a ghost. Both girls were trembling from head to toe. By the time they told me their story, I too was shaking. I never doubted for a minute that what they told me was the truth. I have a great relationship with my daughters and their friends. I am the parent they can talk to about all sorts of stuff. Boys, their parents, problems at school, anything you can think of, the girls talk to me about. The story they told me chilled me to the bone. Even as I'm typing this, I feel the icy fingers of fear trailing down my spine. My daughter kept saying, Mom, you're not going to believe what happened, but it really, really did. Her friend Tiffany just nodded her head, staring at me with wide, deer caught in the headlight eyes. Once the girls had drank nearly half a gallon of water each and calmed down a bit, I called on my wonderful neighbors who had been out looking to notify them that the girls were home safe. By the time I finished, the girls were ready to tell me what had happened. They began the story, alternating talking. First, my daughter began. She explained how she and Tiffany had both felt compelled to walk in the maze-like direction that they had gone in. They had never been to that area before and had no idea where they were going, but they just felt led to go the way they did. They eventually would wind up in the middle of the woods. They came upon a large hole, about six feet in diameter. The girls had looked down into the hole. They said it was very dark but it appeared to be about 200 feet or so deep. They began speculating why a large hole had been dug in the middle of the woods. They talked about it being a possible bottom dump for a serial killer or such. Tiffany had made the comment, your mom would kill you if you dropped your phone down there. Trisha had been holding her phone, shining the flashlight app to try and illuminate the hole. Immediately after Tiffany had made that statement, Trisha claims that she felt something grab her forearm and jerk her arm forward. Stunned, she dropped her phone, and you guessed it, down the hole. The girls stood there, staring at each other. I imagine with mouths wide open, and eyes wide. They discussed how they could retrieve the phone as they stared down into the hole. The girls
girls said that they then heard a sound coming from down that hole. It sounded like a group of people whispering, but the whispering sounded evil, not at all like how a group of normal people would sound. They were unable to distinguish what the whispers were saying. Then, Tiffany was the one who saw it first. She told Trisha not to move and look up. There, across the hole from where the girl stood, was what they described as a shadow person. It was a black mist in the shape of a large man. One of the girls, they couldn't remember which one, just said, run. So the girls took off. They were about two miles away from home and they ran the entire way. My daughter has been repeatedly asked by the track coaches at school to join track. She's in excellent shape and works out several times a week. Tiffany, like my daughter, is a skinny little twig, but she isn't in such great shape. She said she had no idea how she was able to run that far without stopping to take a breath. I do. It was my prayers. My prayers summoned angels that God commanded to bring those girls home to me, and they did. They came straight to me, not to their friends who were already back at home, and not to Tiffany's dad. If I hadn't been praying, I'm not sure what would have happened, but I had that strong feeling that I've never had before that caused me to start praying. I then explained to Trisha that I didn't give a damn about a cell phone. I told her that a phone can be replaced, but she cannot. I told her that in the future, she needs to remember that, to never put her life on the line for a phone or any other material possession. It took some time for the girls to completely calm down, but after a good dinner, they were nearly back to normal. But this isn't the end of this dark story. The next day, it was a repeat of the day before. Trisha and her friends, this time the whole crew, were all out and about. I had been online shopping for a new cell phone for her. I knew that it was probably impossible for us to retrieve that phone, and honestly, I didn't care to have that thing back. It was around 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Trisha and her friends burst in again. She had to tell me something. As she was talking, my cell phone rang. I could not believe my eyes when I saw who the call was coming from. The caller ID said, Trisha. Everyone fell silent as they all could clearly see my daughter's name displayed on my phone. With shaking hands, I picked it up and said hello. I'm not sure how to explain what I heard, except that it was identical to the sound the girls had both heard coming from that dark hole. To me, it sounded like some sort of void, like a wide open space with malevolent whispering. I put it on speaker so that everyone in the room could hear it. Then the phone went dead. We all just stared at each other, no one knowing what to say. Then Trisha and Tiffany. Both began saying how the phone had hit the ground hard, and the possibility of it even still working was probably none. They had been able to barely see it with Tiffany's phone, but they both agreed that it had seemed like the battery had been lying out of the phone a few feet away. Now, although I am a hardcore believer in the paranormal, I am still quite the skeptic. In any situation, I honestly try to find a logical, rational explanation first. I said that perhaps the phone was still working, and whoever found it, just put the battery back in. Both girls kept saying how the hole was so deep and creepy looking. Who in their right mind would go down there? Well, someone strung out on drugs would, I said. I then tried calling it back, but there was no answer. My other daughter told me that I should send a text, so I did. I just said, who is this? Several minutes went by, and there was no response. We all discussed who could have gotten Trisha's phone. The girls explained that the hole was very dark, and very creepy looking, and deep. Who in their right mind would climb down there and get anything out of that hole? But finally, my rational mind decided that this is just what happened. It was probably a gang of thugs that used that hole in their hideaway. They found the phone, and now they're pranking the owner. 
Trisha has a lot of friends, so she had about 40 contacts on her phone. There were five of her friends there in my living room. None of them had received a phone call. She called a few other friends, and none of them had received one either. Okay, so they just decided to prank her mom. I began to dismiss the whole thing when I received a text. Once again, the room was silent as everyone looked at me. I opened the text and my blood ran cold when I read it. In response to my question, who is this? Someone had texted, shadows. I felt real terror at this. However, when I looked up and saw the fear in both my daughter's eyes, I buried that fear deep inside. I've been both their mom and dad. I've always kept them safe and I never want them to feel unsafe or be afraid. I quickly changed my facial expression from what I suspected was horror and I laughed nervously. Being a writer, I can make up a story on a whim. I began weaving a tale about a group of doped up thugs who use a hole as their hideout. I talked about how they go down there and sit around, talking about how they're going to get their next stash of drugs and what sort of shenanigans they could get into. I even did the voices of each imaginary thug. I said, well, hey, looks he's here, a phone. Let's see. Oh yeah, hey, let's call mama. I did this for several minutes and finally everyone began to laugh. I managed to completely convince my girls and the others that the phone had been found by someone like I had described. I promised my daughters a new and better phone and she and her crew went on their merry way. After they left, I went into my bedroom with my phone. I decided to text Shadows back and see what sort of responses I would get. I prayed that someone had found her phone and that he or she was just messing with me. I decided to pretend like I was my daughter. I figured that they would probably avoid me and would be more likely to respond to a child. So for the next couple of hours, the texting went on. It would take them about 10 to 15 minutes to respond to me. The textathon went like this. Where are you? Oh. Okay. I'd like to get my phone back. Can you meet me and my friends someplace? No. Come to the hole. I don't really remember how to get there. Can you please meet me at the Chevron? The gas station is out on the street near to the area where the hole is. No. Hole. How do I know you won't hurt me? You don't. My mom is pretty mad. Can I please get my phone? Come now. At this, I wasn't sure how to respond, so I didn't text back. Come, or someone will get hurt. Why do you want to hurt me? Not you. Then who? Innocent. At this, I deduced that whomever this was was talking about my daughter and knew that it was me texting and not her. The next text proved me right. I've been watching her. You leave her alone, you sick bastard. Then you come now, or else. Again, I didn't text back. Instead, I called my daughter to come home now. Then you come now. You've been warned. I shut off my phone. My daughter and her friends rushed in moments later. I had quickly debated whether or not to tell them about the text messages. I wanted to shield Trisha from anything that would make her afraid, but I knew that she always had to be out and about, running all over the place. It would take something big to make her stay away from the woods and to be more cautious. Something big like this. I showed the text messages to Trisha and her friends. I saw the fear in all of their eyes. I made Trisha swear that she would never go out into the woods ever again and that she would always be with a group, never alone or just one other. She swore to me that she would obey what I had told her. For the next couple of days, Trisha thankfully stayed home. I received text messages from her phone asking me where I was and demanding me to go to the hole. I ignored them. What would I say? On the third day, I didn't receive the text. Curious, I texted, are you there? About 15 minutes later, I received a text back. Yes, 
On the fourth day, a couple of guys from the neighborhood, I guess saw it as a challenge, and went to go get Trisha's phone. They went out to the hole. It took them an hour to find with a rope. After about 30 minutes or so, they retrieved her phone. The guy had took a picture of Trisha's phone where it lay in the hole. He didn't know about the phone call and text messages. I'm honestly not sure why he decided to take that picture. Trisha's phone was laying in the hole. Tiffany and Trisha both said exactly in the same location where she had dropped it. The girls swear that it didn't appear to have been moved at all in the photo. You could clearly see that the back of her phone had snapped off. The battery was lying approximately at least a foot away from the phone. When the guys brought the phone back, they made the remark about how could someone have called from it. They both looked puzzled, and it was obvious that neither knew anything about the phone calls or text messages. Trisha put the phone back together, and the battery was completely dead. After the phone had charged for a few minutes, she tried to use it. It no longer worked. I had found Trisha a really good deal online for a new phone. I hadn't ordered it yet. Instead, I went back online and placed an order for a special deal our cell phone provider had going on for two phones. I gave my phone to a friend who really needed one, but couldn't afford it. Thankfully, I haven't received any strange text messages on my new phone. But two nights ago, around three o'clock in the morning, I received a call. I had turned my phone off, so I didn't notice it until the following day. I had played my voice messages, and the phone call was on there. At exactly 3.02 a.m., someone called. The message sounded like a void, with some eerie whispering. When I searched through the call log, there was no record of this phone call at all. Only the eerie voice message. On a dark cold night in the late 70s, my dad's truck broke down about an hour from home. He started walking and put his thumb out hitching for a ride, and was soon picked up by a middle-aged man in a brown sedan. My dad gets in the car. Thanks, man. I appreciate the lift. The driver doesn't respond. I'm trying to get further north. Where are you headed? Driver again doesn't respond and begins to drive. Without even a look, the driver locks the doors and puts his hand on my dad's upper thigh and squeezes. My dad was 24 to 25 years old. He worked in construction, specifically drywall. He wasn't a tall man, but he was barrel chested and stocky. My dad turns to face him. I'm not into that. I just need a ride. The driver doesn't move his hand. After 10 seconds of silence, let me out of the car. Driver doesn't respond. Doesn't even look at him. My dad grabs a hand and peels it off his thigh. Let me out of the car, motherfucker. I'll kick your fucking ass. Let me out now. My dad was ready to strike. Without a word, again without even looking at him, the driver pulls over, unlocks the doors, and my dad jumps out. The driver peels off. My dad eventually arrives home and tells everyone what happened. Family doesn't believe him. A few years later, he's dating my mom. They're watching the news, which is covering the arrest of serial killer John Wayne Gacy. My mom said my dad went pale. My dad jumps out of his chair, shaking violently. Started screaming and pointing at the TV. That's him! That's the guy who picked me up! My mom said she believed him immediately. My dad wasn't much of a liar or prankster. He was blunt. He was rather quiet and didn't particularly crave attention. I was so intrigued by this incident that in the late 90s, I read a few books on Gacy, including the one written based on his interviews. Gacy picked up countless hitchhikers over a multi-year period in the 70s. Sometimes he would pick up hitchhikers and take them wherever they wanted to go, without incident. The timeline, details, geography, M.O. are all consistent. My theory is that Gacy picked my dad up, thinking he was younger than he was, and then he tested out my dad's reaction. My dad was a bit older than Gacy's target age of 18 to 20. When my dad fought back aggressively and immediately, Gacy figured he wasn't worth the trouble, 
and possibly also realized that my dad was not as young as he looked. A few years ago, my husband and I were at an event, and we started chit-chatting with a couple, seated at our table. For some unremembered reason, I told this story. The female half of the couple turned white and stared at me, mouth agape. She said that her uncle was an almost identical Gacy encounter. I'm just so sad for those who were unable to escape. When I was 18, I worked at a local coffee shop in my hometown, and I often worked there, picking up shifts and closing six nights a week. I had a lot of regulars and lots of randoms, but other than a few awkward orders, I never really had a problem with a customer being inappropriate or out of hand. This night was already really stressful for me, as it was Halloween. Not that it had anything to do with the interaction and I was a little bummed to be closing while my friends were out and about. But I had friends go to a house that my friends rented right down the street after work with some pastries and Red Bull, so I really didn't mind too much. It was about 9.45, and I was already ready to close right at 10. It had been dead since about 8, and all I had to do was the final register count. Everything was clean, and I was reading a book to pass the time, trying not to watch the clock, our counter, by the way, is like a bar counter, long, with a register near the door at the closed end, and with the one far end open for us to go in and out of, right near the door to our back room. A man walked in the front door. He looked like he was in his mid-twenties. He was black, had on a big hoodie, and was wearing sweatpants that sagged down so I could see the waistbands of two different pairs of gym shorts underneath. I am a young white female, but I have no fear of people, and I'm not a racist, so I didn't bat an eyelash when he walked in with one hand in a hoodie pocket and the other in the pocket of one of the pairs of gin shorts. Men of all races wear clothes like that and carry themselves that way, at least where I live. So with no concern, I greeted him and asked him how he was and what he was thinking of ordering. He took his time responding, but wasn't looking at the menu or at our chalkboard with seasonal drink offers. He was looking at the front door. He took about a minute, then turned to me and asked my name. I often had male customers ask this, females too, so I told him, and then asked again what he was looking to order. He began to ask me more questions about me and my job. He asked if I liked it. I responded, thinking maybe he wanted a job application and gave him a very short version of how I felt. It was almost 9.50. I kept checking my phone, thinking that I just wanted to make his drink so I could clean up again and meet my friends. He nodded, saying he thought I liked my job, which I thought was strange, but again, didn't think about it. I agreed again. He then started to ask about the shifts I worked. I figured he had sympathy that it was Halloween, and I gave him a vague answer. He didn't ask why I didn't work on Thursdays. My heart jumped. I didn't see that one coming from a mile away. I struggled to respond, and he continued, and asked if Sunday mornings were better than Wednesday nights. At this point, I broke into nervous laughter and smiles, asking if he was looking to work for the coffee shop, and that we needed the help. He stopped smiling at this point, and his hand in the hoodie pocket made an abrupt move to the very inside pair of gym shorts, basically so that he would be grabbing himself. He didn't quite reach in all the way, and I felt like I was going to pass out. I asked him to order or leave, as the end of our business day was almost there, and that I needed to clean and lock up. At this point, I grabbed my cell phone and kept it in my hand, thinking how I can dial 911 and not have him begin to molest himself in front of me, or whatever he planned on doing. He began to sort of lean on the counter and ask me questions. He asked me where I lived. Did I have a boyfriend? What were my plans for the night? I was trying hard not to cry and tried my best to lie through more vague answers, hoping he would go away if I just didn't freak out. He began to move away from the register, still leaning on the counter. 
hands in his pants, towards the open end of the bar. I began to back as far towards the front door as possible, but that end had no opening and was so high I couldn't jump it without considerable effort and climbing over an espresso machine. The only other exit I could think of was our narrow drive through window. Clutching my phone, I asked him what he wanted. For some reason, he stopped. He stood up and looked towards the front door, then turned to look at the clock behind him. I took the chance to start writing a text message to my friend, and I said, If I am not at your place in 10 minutes, call the police. He caught me sending the text and asked me who I was texting. I told him my boyfriend, and his face became something that I will never forget. His eyes blazed, and he was still as stone. He calmly told me to throw my cell phone across the floor, specifically telling me to try and throw it to the drive through I had to really toss it about nine feet away. After, he began to scream, making his way again down the counter. He asked me how I could have a boyfriend when he has been watching me at work for the last two months as often as possible and had never seen a man drop me off or pick me up at work. He pointed to the side of the building that I parked on and said he knew I parked my blue Toyota there earlier and not to lie to him. I asked him to leave, beginning to cry. He began to describe my work shifts to a T when I came in, when I left, how I smoked across the street on break. He told me that he knew that I only drank the Diet Coke that we sold, and that I always cranked my music up when I started in my car. At that point, he pulled a small gun out of the gym shorts and waved it around as he said that I was stupid to lie to him, that he knew it all. He was going between enraged and laughing, as if he couldn't believe that I didn't want to talk to him, or that it was funny that I was scared. I offered him all the money in the register, and he laughed again like hysterically, and then again went still. I'll never forget this moment, as he said, I am not here for any money, Marina. I am not here for a job. I think you know what I am here for. I'm sobbing now, and it made him either frustrated or sympathetic, and he began to say how I just needed to calm down, that he was just really excited to meet me. He still had one hand down near his dick and began to fondle himself, holding the gun with the other hand and about three feet away from the opening in the bar. I asked him again to please leave. When he didn't move, I asked him what I did to him and why this was happening. He began to speak, saying that I was really pretty. He was continuing to talk when all of a sudden, my friend walked in the door with his friends in tow. There were five guys all together and all in a metal band together, so they are a pretty distinct group of guys. The man quickly put the gun in the hoodie pocket, so quickly that only two of my friends noticed it. He ran for the door, pushing past my friends, and disappeared into the night. I threw up as soon as he was gone, and two of my friends ran after him, but didn't gain on him enough and didn't see where he went to. I quit my job the next day and called the police. There was never any follow-up, and I still wonder about what the fuck did or didn't happen to me that night. First time poster, not really a long time viewer, but you get the drill. I never told this story to anyone except my brother, but I guess the whole event has blown over by now. Back in 2009, I lived in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area. I was really into this card game called Yu-Gi-Oh, which was also an anime TV show. It's your standard fighting slash deck building card game, but that's besides the point. I used to go to Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments with my older brother at my local game shop, and there was a fair share of odd people. Most of the people who went weekly had nicknames, because that's what it was like on the TV show. My brother got the nickname Igloo because he played a penguin deck and he was super pale. I always wanted a nickname. One time, I went to the tournament without my brother. I played this guy whose nickname was the Mermaid. 
The mermaid was relatively short, heavy set, and usually very quiet. From the moment we started the first game, I knew he was strange. He kept telling me how good I was at the game, how he liked my dice set, just generally weird, things aren't related to the game. I lost the first game, and he was pretty pleased with himself for beating a 13 year old, but I wasn't going to whine about it. The second game I absolutely crushed him, and he seemed pretty pissed. Right before we started the third game, things got uncomfortable. How about we make a wager or something? He talked very quietly as he held my hand in a very tight grip. You mean for cards? I replied, breaking free from his hand. If I win, I'll drive you home, he spoke softly. And if you win, I'll buy you a booster pack. I wasn't a stupid kid. There was no way I was going to get into a stranger's car. Before I could say anything, the owner of the store came over to our game and asked him what he was doing. The mermaid went silent. The owner whispered in my ear, If he gives you any more trouble, come to me and I'll kick him out for good. I won the third game, thus kicking him out of the tournament. He left right after the game. After he was gone, I asked the owner why he was called the mermaid. Oh, him? His first name is Ariel, like in The Little Mermaid. It started as a joke, and it just sort of turned into his name. I thought nothing of it until May of 2013, when three girls escaped the house of a Cleveland man who had been keeping them in captivity for years. His name was Ariel Castro, and I could have been the next. So I have this friend. Let's call him Mike. I've known Mike my whole life. He's always been there for me, and he's stuck with me through thick and thin. Growing up, Mike and I, we never really had that many friends. And because of this, we grew very close. We're teenagers now, and high school hasn't been that great for me. I still struggle with making friends, and it never helped when Mike hit puberty and became attractive. All the girls wanted him, and... Soon, I kind of faded into the background. But he never forgot about me. He would still come over every Wednesday night for our annual pizza and horror movie night. Mike and I were watching this new horror movie that came out called Possession, which <laughs> wasn't really anything new in my opinion, but it all began with the last line of the movie was spoken in some weird language. Mike looked over at me with blank eyes and he said, it's never over. Now, at first I was like, what are you talking about? But then I realized he was translating the language that was spoken. I sort of laughed it off and asked him if it was Latin or something, but he just shook his head. Still staring at me with those blank eyes, he said, no, it's a Nokian. Now I had no idea what that meant. So after Mike left, I quickly went to my computer and looked it up. What I found shocked me. It turns out that Enochian was the language originally created to speak with angels, but with was later found out to have been communicating with fallen angels and demons. After that, it became a satanic language. Now I had no idea how Mike would know this language. He could barely speak Spanish. I just sort of blew it off for the night. However, I figured he just picked it up from watching so many horror movies. The next day at school, I went and asked Mike about the language. He just sort of laughed it off and said that he and his buddy learned it so that he could pass notes in class without anybody knowing what they were saying. It seemed pretty legit to me, so I let it go. Big mistake. It was the next day that everything changed. I was sitting in my room when I heard someone yell my name. I ran to my window, so sprinting straight from my house with one of Mike's friends. We can call him Dan. I ran outside to meet Dan and waited for him to catch his breath. He looked up at me, and I was filled with dread. His eyes were filled with terror. I asked him what happened, and all he could wheeze out was, 
Mike. I brought Dan inside and got him a glass of water. Once he had settled down, I asked him again what Mike was doing. Was he in trouble? Dan said Mike was fine, but something had happened to him. His next words caused icy fingers to travel up my spine. Mike and I were walking in the woods when he brought up some weird language that he learned to do weird magic spells or something. I think he called it Enochian. Anyway, uh, he told me that he could kill a frog, so I picked one up and started chanting in this weird, creepy language, and the frog started to wither and dry up like it had been in the sun for too long, and then it died. So I went over to Mike, and when I touched him on the shoulder, he turned around and... You're not going to believe me, but... His eyes were white. Completely white, like they had rolled back in his head or something. After that, he screamed and started chasing me through the woods. He almost caught me when I was near your house. Didn't you see him behind me? Which way did he go? All I could do was sit there in shock. Mike had lied to me. Dan didn't know about a Nokia, and he was never using it for more than just passing notes like he claimed. But the scariest thing about the entire situation was that I didn't see Mike behind Dan. When I ran to my window and saw Dan running down the long street, no one was chasing him. No one was there. I told Dan that he had to go and find Mike. We got into the car and started driving around. I stayed close to the forest line in hopes that Mike would come out laughing and saying that it was all just a prank. We never found him that day. After I had dropped Dan off at his home, I started making my way back to my own house. I took the route near the forest again, and as I was driving, I swore that I saw something in the corner of my eye. So I slowed down the car and looked in the direction that it had come from. What I saw still haunts me to this day. Mike was there, about a hundred feet from my car. But he wasn't standing normally. No, his, his back was bent almost in half, and his neck was cranked towards me. He was staring at me with white eyes, somehow full of venom and hatred. He was also very pale, and his clothes were ripped and ragged. I slammed my foot on the pedal and sped away, wanting to get as far away from him as possible. The rest of the way home, I could have sworn that I saw Mike sprinting after my car in my rearview mirror. But every time I looked up to check, there would be nothing. That night I was sleeping when I woke to the sound coming from my window. I turned and almost cried out. Mike was there, peering in at my house with those white, hate-filled eyes. I turned on my lamp, but when I looked back, he vanished. I ran and turned on all the lights in my room and never went back to sleep that night. I knew something was very, very wrong with my friend. My room was on the second story. The next day, I went to school as normal, and I was shocked to see Mike sitting with a group of girls. When he saw me, he looked at me with a huge cartoon grin on his face and blinked. I got a sick feeling in my stomach and ran back to my car, not wanting to deal with school that day. I'm now sitting in my room, typing this out. My parents are out of town for the week, so I'm home alone. Only, I don't think I'm alone. I can hear tapping noises coming from my closet, and somehow I think I know who it is. So heed my warning, please. I never mess with satanic rituals. It will never end. When I was researching the deep web, I was browsing for videos that would give me content to write about. It was an unenjoyable experience, just like this whole endeavor has been. Paying to watch these streams makes me feel horrible about myself. Now it was a Wednesday, early in the morning, so not many streams were available, maybe about four. But one was quite a bit more popular amongst the others, with about 400 people already queued to watch. The title was Sleeper Slaying. Brutal, high quality. 
the number tick from 414, then to 416. There was no maximum number, simply a growing count of viewers. The timer was at 720, so the stream was about to start. It sure was pricey though, 0.75 bitcoins to enter. I had two bitcoins in my wallet, so I decided to buy into the show. The first difference was that this was the first of two showings I had viewed so far that had a chat. People of different languages were speaking in the chat, only a few tidbits of English could be made out, usually just referring to their excitement for the show. The buffer had taken about six minutes, so there was only about a minute of chat to watch when the timer hit zero. The blurry gray screen turned to color. Slowly, a pixelated image came into view, and my heart froze in terror at what was on the screen. A child was asleep in her bed. A window to her left had moonlight streaking over her harmless body. The sheets covering her small figure had a neat pattern of pink and blue. It was just a sight you can't forget. I didn't take notes to recall it in such detail. The video was high quality, which is what I'm assuming is something that attracts viewers. It was like a 1080p setting on a YouTube video. A terrible analogy to make, but it's one that gets the point across. The camera seemed to be stationary, and from a small ballet figurine that was next to the lens, I'm assuming the camera was placed on top of some sort of dresser, facing the innocent child. After about 20 minutes of still silence, a figure next to the bed slowly stood, towering over the defenseless child, the figure that still haunts my nightmares. That nearly prompted me to turn my discoveries over to the police in an effort to stop these monstrosities. The man was dressed in a black drape, almost like a robe of some sorts, but tied close to his body. It's hard to explain. It looked very odd. Might have just been the camera angle. He was wearing some sort of mask, hard to make out in the dark. It looked like some sort of animal, like a pig-type mask you find in a Halloween store. The man looked towards the camera and did a small wave of his hands. He reached under his garbs and produced a small strip of what looked like cloth and a curved knife, like a small sickle. He pulled the cloth tight between both hands and then quickly wrapped it around the child's head. He did it with such speed, like a practice. The child began to stir, but it was too late. The looming figure repeatedly slashed the child's face, the soft sound of ripping flesh just barely audible from the camera's position. As blood projected onto the walls, onto the man's garb, onto the child's sheets that were supposed to protect her from scary things of the night, I didn't gag. I didn't close my laptop and vow never to return to the deep web again. I just sat there. The rest of this was sort of a blur to me. The man repeatedly slashed the child's face and then proceeded to what I assume was sodomized the face of the body, then quickly saunter back to the camera, where he did something that, even though I was still in shock, I will never forget. He lifted the bottom of his mask, revealing a deathly pale mouth, stuck in a wide grin. With that, the stream stopped, and I was returned to the main page of the site. The personal part of this story was told to me by my friend's older brother, Jay, and his mom. The rest is common knowledge around my hometown. When Jay was about ten years old, in 1992, an ice cream truck started driving around town. It was in the middle of summer. The truck stopped at all the lakes and parks in our town, and nobody thought much of it. Because our town is small and rural, and of course we have an ice cream truck. Being ten, Jay was excited whenever he heard the ice cream truck drive around. That is, he was excited until he actually convinced his mom to give him some money and let him buy an ice cream. He sprinted to the truck, which stopped a block from his house, but he got a very funny feeling from the guy. He is one-fourth Native American. His mom is half, and is an actual medicine woman, and the whole family believes heavily in trusting their intuitions. So Jay backs away and goes home, 
even though there was a group of three or four boys at the truck already. He told his mom about his inexplicable feeling of unease when he saw the man, and his mom told him to stay away if the man didn't feel right. A couple weeks later, two boys went missing while they were out at a park. Their moms had turned their backs for less than a minute. At first, it was assumed that they went exploring to the nearby creek looking for salamanders, but after hours of searching, it came out that the last vehicle seen in the area was the ice cream truck. Then the truck stopped showing up for a few days. Cue the police asking the town officials about the ice cream man. It turns out that nobody knew the guy. He didn't fill out paperwork, or get a license, or whatever it is you have to do to drive your child bait through town. Nobody had thought anything of it, cause this guy just showed up and seamlessly started driving his route one day. I guess he had scouted the locale beforehand in another car, or on foot, and picked out all the areas with kids. The driver, being a sick fuck, couldn't contain himself for long, and started driving his truck around the shittiest of my town's seven trailer parks a week after the boys went missing. This trailer park is literally on the wrong side of the tracks, with a railroad running right down the side, and our town dump is just a little farther down the street. It's at the very edge of town, with nothing else around it but empty woods. I forgot to mention, my town is in rural Michigan, so this trailer park was about a mile deep into the woods, and it was creepy as fuck, even without a pedo on the loose. So the cops were called, and were told that the guy was living in this trailer park. They found his truck with a tarp haphazardly thrown over it, and burst into the nearby trailer and arrested him. Since this is where the local legend starts taking over, I don't really know what they found inside the trailer. I have heard that the trailer was full of memorabilia from past children, and I have heard it was just a shitty trailer that looked like a hobo with a roofing plastic fetish had lived there. I do know that the guy ended up confessing after police found some evidence in his trailer, telling the police that he had kidnapped, raped, and murdered the two boys, finally dropping their bodies at the dump down the street. It was the grisliest thing to happen in my town's history, and a few years later when I was growing up, things were much more strict. There are cameras at all the parks now, an organized neighborhood watch program, and a see something, say something law was enacted. Once smartphones became popular, I downloaded the Sex Offender Database app and set it to my hometown. Holy shit. My hometown is Sex Offender Central. There are a dozen sex offenders living in the downtown area, maybe ten blocks by ten blocks, and over three dozen within the boundaries of my school district. Hell, one lived less than a mile away from me, on some dark, wooded dirt road. I have gone running in the middle of the night down that road, more times than I can count. <laughs>